Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy. I'm joined, as usual, by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. How are you, Cass? I'm doing good. Uh, I just got through a long drive, but... We're joined by a special guest today, Ed Zitron, CEO and founder of EZPR and author of the Easy Substack. How are you? I'm doing great. Just another day in paradise. I spent most of the day reading the examiner report for Celsius. 600 gripping pages. <laughs> it's like 85 pages with like a million pages of notes. It gave me a migraine. I had to go and like have a lie down for half an hour. Just read about Alex Mashinsky and I watched a bunch of his interviews too. And oh my God. We've been talking about him for a really long time and Celsius for a really long time. I mean, it was such an obvious Ponzi scheme. I'm glad that's exactly what it's being called right now. And also by its own staff. The guy was like, yeah, I'm a Ponzi consultant. It's like, why would you ever say that? Even as a joke. <laughs> why would you start a group chat called Wire Fraud? That is funny as hell. Are you suggesting you're not currently in any group chats called wire fraud cast okay but i'm also not in charge of billions <laughs> and billions of dollars of other people's money so you know that we know of <laughs> cast coin uh, cast coin is broke ladies and gentlemen anyway what we wanted to chat about today uh with you is nfts which i don't know you, so you, can, you can get us started on this I, I know you wrote an article in november of 2021 called the nihilism and exploitation of the nft industry you were really really not into it despite your ending uh, yeah. being something along the lines of even if many of these artists have good intentions the entire thing is built on bad economics and yeah. and bad for the planet type stuff um yeah do you want to get yeah. into how you feel about it right now of course so bit of background on me. I collect original comic artwork, or at least I did until I ran out of wall space. So I am like the exact kind of mark for these things. I should be the person you can sell this to. So for this to bounce off me, there has to be something fundamentally wrong with it. And the fundamental wrong with NFTs is the same thing as before, which is they're pretty shit artwork. They're not a great vehicle for artwork. And they're not even a particularly good vehicle for anything else. I'm sure you guys have seen the uh, Dookie Dash. Familiar with Dookie Dash? The wonderful thing for your investment in your board apes, what you will get is an Ebaum's World game. That's already been exploited. Like, oh, was it? They, oh, good. I assumed it would happen. Yes. Yes. People have reported exploits that have allowed them to get some of the high scores on it. So it's not even working as like the skill-based mint it's supposed to be. And what did they fucking expect? It is a terrible web game for a profit-seeking entity. What was the name of the original game? It's basically the game Tempest from the 80s. It's such lazy design and there's no creativity behind it. And I think... At least they were open about the fact that it was just purely about shit yeah what was that as well who is the market for this who is the market if i was someone who was concussed enough to buy an one hundred fifty thousand dollar ape and i saw i was like sitting there telling all my dickhead friends don't worry this company you collapse they're working on some great things and then this bullshit comes up oh boy but as you said like who's spending one hundred fifty thousand dollars on um monkey pictures. This isn't relevant, but there's one point I want to say, and that's that like the plot, the conception of the game is really stupid. So glad you brought this up. They get this key in this treasure chest. One of the apes has it, then another one somehow drinks it during this party and they realize he drank it. But instead of like waiting for him to excrete it and then just grabbing it out of the toilet, they somehow decide they're going to flush it down and then need to go into the sewers to retrieve it. The entire conceit of the game requires every participant to be stupid. <laughs> I've watched this seven or eight times because I hate myself. It is the same monkey who takes an atomic shit. The shit opens a portal through which another monkey comes with a box with a key in it, which is, again, too many controversies already then they decide instead of doing anything with the key they decide to have a party someone puts the key in a beer and the same monkey jimmy the monkey drinks the beer and then shits it out and then they go let's go down the toilet i honestly would love to see inside of andreessen horowitz he's just sitting there it's like the trial of jimmy the monkey he's like what what have you done he loves it he's like yes this is, this is the height of culture. This was definitely worth $450 million. <laughs> as long as he can sell it for more money, he really, really, really doesn't care. He's escaped consciousness like a Final Fantasy endgame boss. 
Cass, what you said there, I think, gets us back to the question, right? Is that it, it's pretty clearly like an exploitive and extractive creation, right? Yeah. It's not something of creativity. It's people trying to get whatever money they can out of the marks they've identified. We didn't do any NFTs, obviously, but we had Mark Cuban on the show, and he was just very pro-NFT. And I think our pushback disappointed everyone. Like we we had such little pushback. Mostly I think we just don't care that much about NFTs. If you if you have pushback, feel free. But it's like it's not my well, <laughs> my it's not what I am excited about in the cryptocurrency space. No. That, that's certainly true. I find them incredibly boring. Part of the problem I think for us in that episode is in my mind my criticism was implicit in the thing I was saying. It's these NFTs that you would tie to a specific marketplace and then use it in this way so you collect the royalty instead of Ticketmaster. So like in my mind, the criticism is clear in that question, but I think the way it ended up coming across is, oh, NFTs beat Ticketmaster. <laughs> I can see how someone might fumble that bag of logic. There are some people who don't realize Ticketmaster is just an evil company and you are just being evil like them. I think that that's where all the Andreessen money and all the NFT money came from. It was just they and web. It goes back to Web three as well, which is they just wanted to try and control the new internet. They thought this would work. It didn't really because none of them knew about like the seven or eight different guys defrauding everyone. Those guys are a season three problem. <laughs> Your point about Ticketmaster is excellent, which is yeah, of course they wanted to take over that. They wanted that to happen. They were um, Dapper Labs didn't give a shit about fan experiences. They just wanted to take over from tops. And the Bored Ape stuff, anyone who seriously tried to explain the fucking Bored Apes to me, oh yeah, the Bored Ape, it's the next Marvel. No, it isn't. God damn. You don't know the history of anything, let alone comics. I really got off on reading people like, yeah, let me tell you why this is important. It's just like, yeah, you fucking idiot. You are so worried about being wrong that you refuse to you, be right. You won't believe how beautiful these the Emperor's new clothes are. Yeah, but that was... I wrote a piece called The Emperor's New Blockchain. It was the same shit. Like, the idea of a unique digital thing is not a bankrupt idea. I really don't think so. However, I do not think you need it on the Ethereum blockchain. I do not think you need it on any of that shit. It's not better. Oh, you've got a small television that I can look at my JPEG on. Jesus Christ, I'm going to feel depressed every time I look at that. I, I can, and that's the thing, look, I got the weird shit behind me. I love collecting stuff. I should be the guy, but I'm not. It just bounces the hell off me. Well, that's part of my whole thing where I find little reason for me to criticize them because I actually collect coins, right? Which is ridiculously stupid. Like, they're not investments at all. They're just a bunch of poor decisions. So I'm like, if a bunch of people want to make poor decisions, like, I can't hate on them that much for it. I'm wondering if you would disagree with that, like, that assessment. I would say it was harmless if it was harmless, but it isn't. I think probably millions of dollars of people got conned by Top Shots, for example, by all those Wall Street Journal and New York Times stories about this guy made a million dollars in a LeBron James gift. All these people got conned. They are victims. You can say it's harmless until it becomes something that is a financially manipulated thing. And I guess all art kind of is, but there is something nakedly exploitative about the price stuff with NFTs. The people who get access to them early, it's the same shit as cryptocurrency regular. It's this thing where the rich just get richer because people use NFTs to monetize their influence. It all comes back to raw profit. These aren't a community. They are fundamental. I think they're securities, but I'm neither a lawyer nor particularly bright enough to run the Howie test, but it really is this deep, meaningful connection to cryptocurrency. If NFTs were entirely removed from the value side, I would have more respect, but something about Top Shots was really bad too. It's because they become these frothy fucking markets and people get taken by them. And it's bad. It's very bad. The most frustrating NFT project to me, and I think the reason it was so frustrating is because of how exploitive it was in the way it ended up being covered was Axie Infinity, right? Because you had the media coverage talking about how people were earning a living in this game and like where if you reviewed the token, like the economics of the system they were participating in, it was clear that it was not going to be a sustainable way for a meaningful number of people to make a living. But there was this period where those kind of stories were often run kind of uncritically. And I think that probably contributed to more people ending up participating in this system. A system like that, that is so clearly designed for exploitation and trying to take advantage of that flywheel to keep people hooked, feels a little bit different to me than 
people making his prints and selling them to whatever people want to pay for them, right? Because like one of them is like so clearly designed to try to hook people in and keep them connected. Axie Infinity is fucking evil as well. That's another level, and it's I mean it's fair to bring it up. Um, plus, getting hacked by North North Korea is not something to brag about. In the history of cryptocurrency, like Axie Infinity fits in so much with what so many of these guys were doing before, right? Quigley, Yantis, and Pierce were all running their first digital asset game before crypto was a thing. Yantis is in the EverQuest guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who now runs Wax with uh, Quigley. He was a co-founder of Tether with Brock Pierce and them. They're all involved in, in cryptocurrency, of course, though. Like, of course they are. Ever, EverQuest gold guys, of course, would be. Yes. And like Brock Pierce in that group talked about developing a human supply chain in China that he could use to supply digital assets. And those were the words he chose. And so like when you look at Axie Infinity, it is the exact same arc that these guys have been participating in since before cryptocurrency even existed. That's fair. But I also wanted to, because we you quickly dropped in the, the mention of Beeple and suggesting like, well, that's like totally different. And it is totally different. It's it, totally different. Marginally different. M- marginally different. But I do think that that Beeple moment it got the attention of every everyone. That was so much money, even if it wasn't really or if it was all insider bullshit. And I reflect on it. And I'm like, there's no way that sells for that if he tries to sell it right now. Right. Yeah. None of these things that remember Justin Sun bought that the like Jack Dorsey's first tweet for a million dollars. Like, th- that's worthless now. I assume that is worthless. Like, who's going to buy that and spend that much money anymore? That did get the, get the attention of the world, and it probably brought in a ton of people who otherwise wouldn't be interested, including artists who got duped and stuff, right? Yeah. And I think that it was just a false gold rush. And the problem is there are several bits to this. So the concept of a non-fungible token over here in a vacuum. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it does not have to operate on Ethereum or any other blockchains. The problem is that digital artwork, I do not believe, is a thing. I don't know. They they really badly wanted to try and connect Fortnite and kids being conned into buying costumes into adults being conned into buying shit artwork. And I'm just not sure anyone really understood what was happening over here in the first place. I've never enjoyed it personally, but like it's clearly a very good game. And people exist in that world and socialize within that world. And thus, the things they are buying are to interact with in that world. That has absolutely no relevance to any NFTs. Because, remember, the fundamental experience with every crypto game is dog shit. And Alexis Ohadian brought this up as well. This concept of, oh, you want to own your game. You want to own your stuff. But gamers don't care. Ask ask gamers. They're like, oh, do you want to own whatever you have? No, no one cares. No one gives a shit. And it's just profit seeking. I think it's been like a major failure, honestly, on like on the NFT front in general, because they accidentally admitted by saying it was play to earn, which just was like, okay, so you're not interested in the gameplay, really. Like you're this is strictly a job. Yeah, it's a job. And this is like about luck and loot box. Like it's just it's a cash grab, like obviously. And so they're like, okay, that that was a mistake. We shouldn't call it play to earn. Like I don't know what they've diverted that name to. But as you're saying is if if you're if the principle behind it is, oh, there's going to be a token and that token's value is going to go. It has to go up. Like if the token is ve- always going to go down in value, no one's going to be interested in your fucking token. So uh, no. the token has to always go up in value. Or if it's NFTs, like what good are the NFTs if they go down in value? It shows me that their cards aren't interested in a, a fun game. I, I've spent God knows how many hours playing Stardew Valley, playing Kerbal Space Program. A connoisseur. Oh no, I respect it. <laughs> and but I don't like you said about about EverQuest and WoW, it's like I don't need an NFT to love this game. What is the value proposition actually, you know? Like what are they trying to do? Oh, I know this one. No, Alexis said this one because I argued with him about Twitter on it on Twitter, it's my psycho. So he was like, Well, don't you want to get rewarded for your time invested in the game? The reward is the enjoyment I get out of it. Have you ever had fun? (laughs) Yeah, I was gambling once and won some money, and that was fun. (laughs) I live in Las Vegas, trust me. (laughs) If I want to just gamble money, it's 15 minutes away if I choose a specific casino, or like eight if I want a particularly worrying one. You want the biggest sign that NFTs are bullshit? Yeah, I, I've not seen a goddamn it. I've not heard anyone talk about NFTs here. And I've lived here two and a half years. Wasn't there an NFT conference that was in Vegas last year? If think of something, it happened here. Both events and conferences in general. 
Well, just think of it like this. This town is built to exploit people legally. And that's very important. You can always walk away. The, the con is that you can do it anywhere. The con is not that you are forced to. In fact, there are big signs to say if you've got a gambling addiction. The NFT community, similar with Web3, is just so fucking pushy. It's hollow culturally. It lacks. None of these people have an appreciation for art. I'm not saying I do either. But like the shit behind me, for example, I love like Eric Tan, three pieces over here, and then there's Queens of the Stone Age poster. I have those because I like looking at them. In fact, that lost one is appreciated by like 950 bucks. Don't care. Never selling it because I like looking at it. I don't think any of these people talk about liking anything. If they were enjoying it, if it seemed genuine, fine. I know people who are fans of things that are painful and awful and onerous and waste of money, Chicago Bears, for example. But it's this thing where there's no joy. There's no real loyalty. It's a loyalty to a clan almost. It's not like these people are collecting and being like, fucking hey, I love looking at this shit. I love looking at my, my artwork. I really do. I take great joy in it. I can tell you a little story about every fucking one of them because I genuinely enjoy it. If you have things around your house and you can't talk about them, can't tell a story, can't say what they're meaningful, that's a problem. You think any of these people have like a meaningful story about like Jimmy the monkey? I don't, but I do think that there is, this is, I guess this is my pushback on this just because you mentioned sports and I think it's like a fair analogy for some of the shit that I see on Twitter. Even like the Bears, like, or, I, or let's use a better example in like the Chicago Cubs. I was just making fun of them. Yeah, the, yeah, but here, let's continue in the Chicago uh, realm. The Chicago Cubs streak of not winning the World Series, some ungodly number, right? But like, I think a part of being a Chicago Cubs fan ended up being like, we can all be losers together, and isn't this great? Even when these NFTs, if they go way down in price, I do see like a sense of community on Twitter where like, and I, they love using that term, I hate using it, but I do see this sense of like them bonding over it, meeting each other, hanging out. I, like maybe you don't, Bennett, maybe you, maybe you guys disagree. No, no. I don't disagree. I just think it's hollow. Have you ever looked at the pictures of board ape meetups? <laughs> like four dudes in cargo shorts and a board ape t-shirt sitting at a hotel bar. They all look like they want to die. <laughs> and I, like, I wish they didn't. But you think about it. You walked into that room and your best case scenario is you have to tell people, yeah, I made a lot of money because I bought the right picture of a monkey. Worst case scenario, you're like, I paid a quarter of a million dollars for a picture of monkey. I had all my monkeys hacked last week because I wanted to make them sparkly. Imagine explaining that to someone normal. <laughs> yeah, I lost half a million dollars because I clicked the wrong link. And uh, oh, so what did you lose? Like Bitcoin? No. No, one was a monkey with its melted eye. The other one was a monkey with a pirate hat. The third one was a monkey wearing Nazi regalia. <laughs> yeah, the one was the Nazi imagery monkey. And the th fourth one was just a picture of a barrel of ooze that I had planned to put on one of the other monkeys. My rocks are gone. My three rocks are <laughs> gone. All my rocks are gone. <laughs> uh, my picture of a fat penguin is also gone. <laughs> but that's the thing. Imagine someone seriously talking about these things and being like, yeah, fuck yeah. Let's talk about penguin. You don't give a shit. Fuck you. I'm sorry. I just do not believe for a goddamn second. Not a single one of these people looks at these things and it's like, hell yeah, that's so cool. Like nothing about money. These things are ugly as shit. I've not seen a nice one. Even people's artworks dog shit. I'm not a fan. <laughs> Here's my question, because like I was obsessed with Pokemon as a kid. Um, okay. And man, that's been like the greatest cash grab in video game history. I don't know. They're all ugly. They're all stupid. I, but it is something fun and enjoyable about the game. But it feels very similar in in the way that it's constructed. It's where it's different, though. It's it's like what I said with Fortnite. What does Pokemon actually come back to? A very good trading card game and a very good series of games. They remake them, but they fundamentally improve on a theme other than the latest one, which is apparently very buggy. But they basically build off of a successful core. And they're ugly and weird, but they're cool. And there is a reason you like them, because you use them in battle, and they do stuff. And they're fun. I get the comparison, though. I actually understand it, because there is, like, the assumed cultural ephemera. But think about it. Where's that for the board eight? Because this company is, they, you guys take, what, 450 million? What have they done? They haven't even put out a shit cartoon. Ash Ketchum is technically 97 years old. And he just won the Pokemon League. He doesn't age. No one's asking why. I've been following Ash and his very long life without aging 
for many years. And that's quite meaningful. I was playing Pokemon games when I was in my teens. I still play them now. I'm 36. What can I do with a bored ape? What can I do with a pudgy penguin? What is the meaning behind them? What is the fundamental story that you can tell about one of those without mentioning money? Because that is the big problem. With Top Shots, you can go, oh, this is a one moment in a very long basketball game that I likely did not even acknowledge when I was watching. It made more sense with baseball and they came out with that way too late. Way too late. The one game it kind of made sense with and they fucked that up. I would understand if and most NFT art was like really weird and cool. Like it was like interactive and you could like move shit around. It was kind of like a oh, something built in like Unity or what have you, or Unreal Engine that was like in a thing that you could like manipulate. That to me is kind of like a science museum thing. That would be cool. A picture of a goat dressed as Pharrell Williams does not interest me. And it also doesn't mean anything. It's procedurally generated, isn't it? Or not procedurally, it's just like generated 10,000 times. By definition, it isn't really that unique. It is a shell wrapped at the same shell in most cases. And I realize there's more than just the PFP ones. Also, you could buy so many cats. Is there? I, I mean, there nominally is, but like in terms of dollars in the market, they, there's not really Oh, God, no, any no. Of Most of them PFP are just projects. like, they're just, they're, they're just PFP things. It is boiling culture down to nothing it really is my real conspiracy lunatic theory is that nfts and things like that and crypto in general took hold because of a death of religion in society i'm not religious personally but people are more disconnected it's harder finding a community and people are more desperate cost more to live in this country and most countries but especially america go broke for medical debt it's truly a, a tough time growing up here and on top of that you suddenly have this place where it's like you can buy into this and you'll be rich in the future. And there's a bunch of people who will always kind of appreciate you because they're all trying to lie to themselves too. And I know that sounds like a joke, but I really don't mean it like that. It's a support group for a bad decision that all of you make so that you can keep making them t t together. And I think that is really what it pisses me off with it. The economy is really what what makes this so evil. And that's why there's so many PFPs as well. I think that that goes much deeper than strictly NFTs or cryptocurrency, unfortunately. Like, I do think that oh, yeah. the gamification of finance, if not a wake-up call for hopefully American society, then too late <laughs> for American society. <laughs> I made a similar point, not directly alluding to religion, but talking about how many of the people who end up attracted to cryptocurrency broadly are these kind of disaffected people who often, for well-justified reasons, feel as though their lot in life is unfair and their prospects for advancement are limited. And so being promised that this is unique, new, innovative, and can help you advance in society while you feel accepted into a community is a compelling pitch for people who are in that situation. Hmm. It is the description of a cult. <laughs> it is how cults operate. It was not a deliberate cult. I do not believe Stoshi was there being like, or like Vita Buterin. I don't don't think he was. You, I do love when people are like, oh, look at Vita. It's like, do I have to? <laughs> He's not a pretty fella. I'm sorry. He's not my type. But the thing is, these fellas, there are like cult leaders within this that are naturally growing. And the only reason they're not growing more powerful is because everything went to shit because some of the cult leaders weren't very smart. But the big personalities and the cults of personalities within this industry, way beyond just NFTs and Web3, are so, so rotten. The whole PFP imagery thing is fucking religious cult shit. It is. It's symbolism. It's, it is semiotic hell. It is really bad. Like, had NFTs kept going up, we would have had, like, a fucking shooting or something. I genuinely think that there is a quasi-religious thing that could have grown from it. Gamifying finance like this is so, so fundamentally bad. Like I said, I live in Vegas. Look at what even the chance of winning money does to people here. Imagine if you added a gambling club where all your gambling friends went and no one at the casino told you you couldn't all sit at the table and show each other your wallets. But this is not a place that encourages congregations of people other than at the table and only at the table. I just, I'm kind of glad 
everything crash because I really think NFTs could have been they could they could be very dangerous in the future if they ever grow this kind of speculative value again. Well, I mean that's that was that's my next question for you. Do you, I assume you don't think this is like the end of NFTs? Or do you? I think it's the end of the massive speculative value for a few reasons. They're, I'll get back to the main one, which is the crypto. Everything's kind of falling apart with crypto. And I think we're about to see, even if it's going up, it's going to go right back down. But the thing is with NFTs is the speculative value grew from board apes. Board apes were meant to be the next Marvel comics. You were meant to, by buying into board apes or a board ape, adjacent product you were meant to be buying into the next marvel comics and each one of these would be worth 150 million dollars and there's going to be tv shows about them that was what was meant to happen what's actually happened is yuga labs has proven to be painfully uncreative just lacking in any fundamental vision or plan it has become so obvious that yuga labs had no plan and doesn't really give a shit what has happened with board apes other than the insane other side sale that for a game that's never coming out, let's be completely honest. Let's be honest. Other side never coming out. If it like based on Dookie Dash, do you really think <laughs> other side a full game where you can connect your entities? Do you, do you see that one popping up? No, I doubt Yuga will go under, but I doubt their value is going to stick. To your point earlier, Bennett, what are NFT artwork things other than PFPs? It's like mo- if PFPs crash, everything crashes, and they're crashing. No one cares. No one cares about this fucking sewer pass. I guess it costs four thousand dollars to play the toilet game, but like that last year, that would have been fifty grand, and there would have been a fucking CNBC story about a fourteen-year-old who was selling them to people because he bought bored apes with his the money he'd stolen from his grandmother. Like it, it has no fundamental reason to keep existing. Respect to Top Shots, they still they keep on fucking that chicken, but. I just don't see how any of these businesses continue because they're not businesses. In Pokemon's case. Pokemon has a game. There's something that you come back to with Pokemon. So even a bad Pokemon game is still a Pokemon game. Pokemon trading cards, if you get a card you don't want, it's still usable in the game. There is still a fundamental reason there. But also, the biggest problem with NFTs, or one of them, let's be honest, is they really have gambled very hard about how much people care about unique. People care about one of 500, sure. Unique, at that point, the value becomes... Basically, a million or zero dollars. It doesn't. It's based on what the market will pay. And like in comic artwork, there are certain eyes. I collect Arthur Adams, for example, which will sell for a couple of grand, depending on what you're looking at. Now, an artist doing a cover who you don't know might be five hundred bucks, but those are decently established, and they're not fifty grand or one hundred and fifty grand or two hundred and fifty grand, unless you're looking at like shit. I'm trying to choose an example. A Dark Knight Returns. Anything from that is worth like a quarter million. But that's because. It's one of the most famous comics of all time. Why is a monkey picture worth a quarter of a million dollars? It isn't. And when you remove all the money, because that's what you have to do to think, is this going to last? Nothing. It doesn't operate with anything. It doesn't. The NFT gaming doesn't work. There's nothing really cool you can do with NFTs that you can't do with like a phone. Oh, I can do a ticket on the blockchain. Oh, great. A slower and worse version of the thing I already hate. Great. Cool. Oh, you get a digital collectible because you bought a ticket. Who gives a shit? I'd rather have some crap on my desk. I really would. I love collecting like funny little things like that. One of the most meaningful things I own is a foul ball that my friend caught by me at a Dodgers game. I remember that because I remember where I was. That to me is the meaning of artwork and art and collectibles. And no NFT seem to have anything to do with that. None of them have any memories. None of these things feel even close to that don't you think that like accurately describes some of the biggest artists of like the past several decades even like don't you think damien hirsch artwork has no soul but like you know eli brode his homie is willing to pay millions of dollars for it and then man that value for all of damien hirsch's work goes up significantly more right like it seems like yes, the same you are pow- correct same power play different different league i don't know except it's the entire industry you can't buy cool cheap nft artwork because it does not exist I haven't seen anything I like. I really haven't. Like, give me something. Show me something. Prove this to me. I would love to be wrong. I love finding new things. I'm open-minded. But it's been years of this dog shit. Years. Of, I was working on a company that aggregated NFTs when CryptoKitties were still around like 2019. Still. We're still with fucking crypto. The cats had sex and they laid an egg. What the fuck are you talking about? I don't care. What is this? What, oh, the, this, this other cat that looks kind of like... I got cats already. I know that's not how they work. Trust me. But 
Also, there's so many weird ways that art can be done in real life. And you have all the power of the internet. And this is it. This? Nothing, 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 nothing. It's all nothing. When Mark Cuban was on the show, he specifically mentioned NFTs as, um, what was it, for uh, reselling college textbooks. Yeah, yeah, we didn't push back on this. This is why I'm like, our, our listeners hated us after that episode because our pushback was just so trivial. We were like... My, my pushback at the time was like, yeah, it makes sense that the publisher would try to do this so that they can own more of the secondary sales. That doesn't mean it's good for the consumer. <laughs> so you had two different good points that you made in the worst possible way to be interpreted. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> so good. Because you're right. Yeah, of course the publishers would love that. They'd love the ability to own a little bit of your textbook forever. College textbooks are a huge scam. But yeah, the right way to put it was, so you want to find a different exploitative measure. But someone like that would never actually crumble. He would just, he would dance around the question until you just gave up. You mentioned CNBC a minute or so ago. Do you have any thoughts on what kind of factors drove some of the breathless media coverage of NFTs? Clicks. It's true. There you go. <laughs> Clicks. This artist made a quarter million dollars. Why were so many people interested in, in that stuff, I guess, is like the, the, the next question there. It's just everyone wanting to get make money. Yeah, FOMO, huh? People were desperate to feel like the future was here and they had some fucking hand on it. Because if you take out all the crypto shit, what are they going to do? Buy treasury bonds? Fuck no. Like, really, how are people, how are normal people making money now? Treasury direct, by the way. I try to shill that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> They're shilling <laughs> NFTs. I'm shilling. I'm shilling Treasury Direct. <laughs> Get your ten grand a year worth of I bonds. Nothing more exciting than I bonds. <laughs> but that's the thing. Reality is boring and slow, and crypto allowed you to understand reality in a kind of enhanced, stupid way <laughs> that felt right. Because and people, a lot of people, when you said, "Hey, this doesn't make any sense," they're like, "Yeah, but the stocks don't either." And it's like, okay, well, kind of, but no. And also, if any stock did anything they were doing here, a lot of people would be in trouble, like jail. I think we have examples of that with like AMC. I, like that's that's when I think about the gamification of that was. I have a I am full scale like Jade Helm conspiracy theory on that shit. I do not buy for a fucking second that retail investors drove GameStop and AMC. I just do not do it. I think a few people jumped on it and some hedge fund was like, or fuck yeah, dude. There's momentum hedge funds who saw it probably start moving and read the gamma and thought, hey, there might be a squeeze here. Because you're right, Reddit, Deep Value or whatever his name was, is not moving most markets. That's just not the way markets work. Markets don't work like cryptocurrency. You can't just have enough force unless you're a fucking hedge fund. I'm going to make my customers 2% this year, and you're going to lose your house. I, I think there's kind of an interesting analogy in AMC there because, again, you saw a lot of the media coverage frame it as these little guys taking on the big system, right? And what really happened is most of the retail investors who saw this going up did not get in right at the beginning of it going up, but got in once the media coverage of it going up started before it started going down. Which I'm sure the hedge funds had not prepared for. How does the media avoid the pitfall of covering a topic that, one, they know will get clicks, two, that is going up and is showing no signs of the trend breaking, right? Like, how, how do you counter that? I guess we push back on stuff like that, but, like, how do you push back and still get the clicks? How do you push back and still get the attention and ad sales, I guess, would be the question. Do you really need those clicks that bad? That is where it's the, it comes down to a very basic moral thing. If you do, perhaps you're in the wrong bit. Perhaps you have a problem. Because CNBC, and I will hammer the fuck out. I have friends who work at CNBC. I love them. But the shit they did with Celsius, the shit they did with NFTs, and the shit they've done with workplace rights is offensive and amoral. Immoral? Yes, immoral. They should know they're doing it. Uh, but they did it for the clicks. And because in some cases, they did it for the hate clicks. It's the same reason like the Telegraph, I don't, I think this may have actually been hoax, but papers like the Telegraph will do like, this 28 year old bought a house when he was 25, how'd he do it? And he got like 50 grand from his parents and also given the house. I think those are written specifically just to piss people off. And I feel like there's a degree of that with the NFTs, but also 
I had this prevailing theory that the media was terrified of being wrong again. 2017, I believe, Kevin Roos at the New York Times wrote, I was wrong about Bitcoin before. Well, he makes sure he makes the same problem twice. But I believe that there is a coterie of journalism that is genuinely scared of making the wrong negative call and not being a hater. And I think so many of them got humiliated because they had full scale emperors fucking dick and balls are out the entire time. And they're just like, looking good, sir. Fantastic. Because the emperor was giving them money and traffic. I'm not saying anyone was paid off. I'm just saying the clicks were coming in. And also, everyone appeared to kind of agree. And then there were a few people on the side, me included, people like you find fellas, like saying, oh, this kind of doesn't look great. And have you checked out one fundamental? And they're like, ah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Kate Rooney on CNBC was interviewing. A, like a banking executive once, I believe, on CNBC in 2021. And he was like, look, if someone's giving you 6% returns, like these crypto banks, I really just don't know how they're doing it. And Kate really went, well, it's because they're lending to institutional invest. And it's like, holy fucking shit. You may not know this as the institution, but the institutions are getting money from these. <laughs> There's always two answers to these. It's like, well, we have an arbitrage. And two, we're, we're getting, we're borrowing and lending to institutions. And it's like, so neither of those answer my motherfucking question. Like you said nothing to me just now. How is it profitable? Arbitrage? What arbitrage? Tell me the arbitrage. Show me the magical arbitrage. Well, no, I can't. I, That's a proprietary algorithm. <laughs> it's a, it's a super secret algorithm that keeps our coin stable. And it's just a bloke emailing another bloke. It always <laughs> is. It's just a guy in emailing another guy. <laughs> It's three dudes in a signal chat called wire fraud. That's all Celsius was. It was just people emailing each other. <laughs> this is an existential risk. I think we're a Ponzi. I mean, isn't that FTX? FTX rock, though. FTX was so stupid, but at least he, like, built something. SBF. So, sorry, I just, he is FTX now. <laughs> That's his hero name. But he, uh, he built, like, software and stuff. There was, if you look, and I, as you as I stuck my head in the toilet of Celsius all day. He didn't, though. There was no. SBF well, didn't. Then, but, okay, I'm saying something, something functioned. Someone built something. Celsius literally appears to be a way they took money in, and they basically created the thinnest possible financial rails. And then they were just like outsourcing everything to some of the dumbest people in the world. I think you just described FTX and Alameda research as well, to be quite honest. OK, that that also is very fucking funny. He was taking customer money, giving it to Alameda research like that. It was. Yeah, yeah. It was just the same fucking thing. It was exactly the same as Celsius. Like I in thought that they sense. had like a software layer. To be clear, they're both deeply evil and I hope they rot in the worst jails. But Celsius is like Alex Mashinsky investing in the worst things. Like FTX did have a at least moderately functional exchange. There's just a gap. Yeah, between, like a product of sorts. Yes. Like, but some people, especially the retail users who seem to not have fully appreciated what an exchange was supposed to do, had a tendency to think FTX was better or more unique than it really was. Like the large scale traders who tended to use it had complaints about the matching engine. And we know there were issues with the liquidation engine based on how like some of the positions Alameda ended up in. So like they built something, but it was still flawed. <laughs> But with Celsius, though, it was so much funny because, and to be clear, SPF, FTX, very bad people. I'm not complimenting them. I'm saying that just reading this all day, there is a guy who made this company called Keyfy. Jason that, Stone, we've talked about him that, before. That story made me laugh because it was like, Mashinsky was like, yeah, I lost money on him before. But, this but that's time how you know they're good. He's like, entrepreneurs always lose first. It's just like, <laughs> what? We're, we're, we're trying to find the trader who blew up their last fund because they went to the school of hard knocks and definitely will not do that again. <laughs> yeah, this guy yeah, knows he's he's learned his mistake. He's learned from his mistakes, which he made immediately, like straight away. They were like, "Hey, did you take any money?" He's like, "Yes." What? No, guys. I think you should really tone it down. You guys are talking about Alex Mashinsky, who is the inventor of VOIP. <laughs> 
<laughs> He's how we're talking. Oh my god. Every time I think about this stuff too hard, I just get really annoyed. Even a year ago, I wasn't this agitated by it. But now I think when I read the fundamentals, when, when I thought like a year ago, when I was like, this is probably all broken. But I didn't think it's going to be completely broken, scammy, but also so dumb, so goddamn stupid, so doofy. Oh, well, let's talk on wire fraud chat. Let me just hop on WhatsApp onto the crime group. What the fuck are you dipshits doing? Didn't any of you think, okay, what if we get caught? Not a single goddamn one of them. They're greedy and not as smart as they think they are. <laughs> but also, none of them were like, I'm going to take 50 million in cash and go to a non-extradition country. Or die. Well, have you heard from Sam Trabuco? That's true. Yeah, Sam Trabuco is gone. Respect, man. If you're going to be a criminal, off of you. Go. <laughs> Why are these journalists asking where I am? I'm going fast over the water, y'all. That really should have been a warning sign like three weeks before Coindesk ran their report. That Sam Trabuco was like, what do you mean? I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I? You'll never know. <laughs> Stop asking. <laughs> Stop asking because this account will burn. <laughs> By the way, fuck you all. <laughs> One thing I noticed during the NFT boom was there was a lot of really half-assed Fortune 500 NFT projects. Pepsi doing a random NFT drop. Mercedes doing an NFT collaboration. Do you have any thoughts on what drove these companies to not only launch NFTs, but do it in a way where it seems like they didn't actually even care whether the project succeeded? Is it the same just don't want to be wrong? Better to like plant a flag out there and say we tried this than to like avoid it? I will tell you exactly how this happened. Call from executive. What's an NFT? Well, I don't know. Great. Cool. So we're doing a Ghostbusters movie. You want 1,000 little marshmallow guys? I don't give a shit. Are they going to make us money? <laughs> Probably not. Okay. Click. I, was like, I think I have to. And so the marketing department was probably told, do this as cheaply as fucking possible. I want this to be light because when this goes wrong, I need to not have spent much money on it. <laughs> and also they were kind of gambling that they'd be worth a lot of money. Are there every single movie dreams of doing like a Revenge of the Jedi style thing where the post is worth money? They, they all, they've all been dreaming of that for years. They all, so Revenge of the Jedi is the old title for Return of the Jedi. There's two different collectible, not collectible, two different posters they mothballed. Long story short, worth a lot of money. You remember when Star Wars Episode One came out? So they did the toys in the same shape as the old boxes. So they tried to make it kind of symbolic. They were just trying to like, ah, can I make some fucking money off of this? I don't and then it didn't work and they went, oh, who gives a shit? Ubisoft was the funniest one though. No one cares. I forgot they did that. Yeah, me too. I totally forgot Ubisoft did that NFT initiative. And like there was a bunch of people on Twitter who were like, this is the future. All the gaming companies are going to come in after this if Ubisoft is on it. And then like they quietly abandoned it or something like three months later. I mean, Coinbase, Coinbase NFTs market, which they invested a hundred million dollars in a building has done like what? No volume. And it just came out that no longer will creators be able to drop new collections using their market. Nice. <laughs> Hundred million dollars of investment. How did it cost them a hundred million dollars? Remember the board eight movies they were gonna do? How has Meta lost twenty-three billion dollars building the metaverse? I don't know, man. I just the whole thing's just so damn exhausting. I just get so confused. Like I'm like, who thought this was a good idea? And I've realized that no one did. No one thought about it for a second. No one thought, like, is this a good idea? Will this make money? Some people did make money. Some people did make money. Yeah, the worst people. Yeah, Mark. Mark Andreessen. One of my favorite moments, like, in the Bored Ape saga that, to me, feels like the Bored Ape story in a microcosm was when Seth Green bought or obtained, let's say obtained, several of the Bored Ape NFTs and announced his intention to make a TV show with them and then got fished. And lost all of his apes. Had actually committed to doing the thing that like Yuga had pitched as what poor apes was going that, to be. He then lost the copyright to it. Because it's supposed to be tied to the apes. Like the license to use it. But then it's turned out it isn't apes. now. It is not tied. That, that's, that's what Ryder Rips maintains is that it's not actually tied to it. And I, I can't, I can't 
deal with that case. So that's as far as my knowledge on it goes. <laughs> if I was a judge, I'd just be like, I, I don't care. I, I'm meant to be helping with murderers and shit. I don't give a fuck about you guys. Next person who says the word ape is being held in contempt of court. And that's my ruling. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because, well, funny is probably the wrong word. Funny, the other kind. But it's just... I'm trying to think of a single hue. I have not heard a compelling argument. Not one. I really am. I've not heard one person who can ex- explain the value beyond sometimes Rolexes are worth money. And like many of the collectible markets that end up having some kind of value, like Rolex, are very intensely manipulated, controlled, whatever, by the central party creating the asset. Yeah. Like, that's the reason Rolexes have a resale value is because there's limits on, like, the circumstances in which they can be resold and how many new ones are created and things like that. It's the reason diamonds are valuable, even though, again, like, there's basically no resale market in those two because De Beers is very controlling in how many they release it in the market and how many are available and things like that. And so like, even when they point to some of these things, they're using it in this way where they try to pretend it's community owned, community controlled, something like that. But their things they're alluding to are always created and controlled by these powerful central entities. And also diamonds are not worth that much. Like diamonds are not a high margin business. And also they have a fundamental value that has been crushed by the forces of capitalism and then international laws around blood diamonds and the GIA. They are heavily controlled. And I think NFTs are because it turned out like 90% of the volume was like 10 guys. It has the appearance of being a natural process without actually being one. Every one of these is beholden to the value of Ethereum or Bitcoin. There's so obvious wash trading with so many of them. So many of them are scams. It's like, I wish it was something cool. I really do. I would love some cool digital shit, but this isn't it. None of this needs to be decentralized. Nobody cares. For what it's worth, volumes are up a little bit. This is going to be the counter to this is that volume is as big now as it was like about a year ago or so. Cass, I love that your steel man version of their argument is... Look it, it's a cockroach. You can't kill it. No one wants it there, but it's alive. <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. right. That's actually true, though. Yeah. Ed, what, any other thoughts? I am all out of them. I think I've ejaculated every thought I have on this subject now. I need to go and throw myself in an icy lake. <laughs> Thank you for having me, though. <laughs> nice final pod- podcast. <laughs> icy lake is still more pleasant than discussing NFTs. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. 